the standard Pokemon hook play. There's two parts. What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook. And I'm the Blade. And I'm uh, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the, the Hook Blade 2, a show about all things Assassin's Creed 2. I'm your host, Lawson, and joining me this week are my two very bestest friends in the whole entire wide world. That's your co-host, Tim, and this week's guest host, Nick. Nick, what's the most important thing that you have to know to be a good Quidditch player? Uh... I don't think there is such a thing as a good Quidditch player. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 90% 90, 90 of the people on my Quidditch team Wait, only play at, Quidditch. not even at my school, Columbia College, Chicago? No, not even at your school. Your school... Damn. I mean, if your school's Quidditch team is anything like mine, 90% of the people on the team are only on it to meet new people and get drunk. Awesome. Yeah. Uh couple notes at the top of the show for you guys uh we do have to mention that we interacted directly with darby mcdevitt on twitter this past week um and considering this entire show has been a scheme to get specifically his attention <laughs> i'm i'm very happy about this if you're not on twitter here's the gist we uploaded a clip of our our fake joke darby interview from episode four and we tagged him in it and he said this very real interview with my very good friends, first host and other host, <laughs> is very dear to my heart and contains some of the very best examples of my ideas about very many things. I very much hope you will enjoy it as I seem to have. And we told him that our, our goal for the show is to have him on for an interview, but then only ask him questions about Assassin's Creed Bloodlines. And he said, and I quote, bring it. So we're going to have our people call his people, and perhaps you can look yeah. forward to that. I guess the catch is we'd have to play Assassin's Creed Bloodlines, which I am not looking forward to. No offense, Darby. I'm pretty sure if you do interview Darby, you have to make that the last episode. I mean, you can't, you can't go downhill. You have to end on a high <laughs> that, note. That, that's the finale of the show. That is the finale of the show. We'll make it happen. We'll have, we'll have our people talk to his people. We'll have our people call his people. Um, moving on from that, let's jump into our main topic this week. Uh, the game Assassin's Creed 2, often considered to be one of the very best games in the franchise, if not one of the best ever, question mark. Uh, so Nick, true or false, you recently played Assassin's Creed 2 for the very first time ever in your life. This is true, yes. I can not confirm. You would not describe yourself as an Assassin's Creed fan, the way that Tim and I are, right? I mean, I'm a I'm a fan of the games, but like I don't know, I play them because it's fun to like jump off of walls and yeah. like kill people. What games in Assassin's Creed have you played all the way through? <laughs> oh God, um, so I'm gonna get a lot of shit for this. No, it's okay. This is I feel like this I, is setting an important context for your thoughts in the that's episode. Fair. Okay, fair enough. So I definitely played Odyssey because I got a free copy of Odyssey. Yeah. Um, I played Unity. Because I got a free copy of Unity. <laughs> I played AC2 because I got a free copy of AC2. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I think back in, back in like middle school, I definitely remember playing AC3. Right. And I played that a lot. So I'm pretty sure I played that all the way through. And I definitely have distinct memories of playing, playing I think it was Brotherhood but I don't think I played all that much of it, so... I didn't know I took that like you a played Unity. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, yeah, I played Unity before I played AC2. Wow, you're a trash person. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I play I play games because they're free and they look cool. Did you get all the way through <laughs> Unity? I did, That's yeah. That's kind of impressive. Wow. That's actually really impressive. I fucking hate getting all the way through Unity. That's the thing, is I remember you guys, like, shitting on it before I started playing it. And you were like, yeah, the graphics are bad. Or not the graphics, no. but like there's the graphics just are so amazing. many fucking... No, the graphics are the best part. No, no, not the graphics. The the All the glitches and shit. Well, that's keep in mind, Nicholas, the reason why... <laughs> I, 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 at least I have such a big problem with Unity, and I, I, I think I can speak for Lawson too, is that we were so okay. excited for it. And it was such a disappointment. Because last year, you know, with the Notre Dame fires, um, AC released it out for free. So I, I played that. 
So I had like no inclination or anything like you guys did playing. So I was like, oh, cool. I've been to Paris. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I, I like I like the idea of playing in Paris and running around the Eiffel Tower and shit. That sounds kind of neat. And I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. But the Eiffel Tower wasn't even in that game. It was it was it was in the Helix Rift. Well, yes, correct. That was a disappointment, but that's fine. <laughs> It hadn't been built yet, I guess, right? That's a thing. That's that is correct. But we're not here to talk AC Unity. No, we're not. That's we're a great point. We're here to point. talk AC2. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> Maybe in a few weeks. <laughs> but uh, we are we are here to talk about AC2. And the reason we brought you on, Nick, as I'm sure you know, but our audience might not know, is because we thought it would be interesting to include in this conversation because, you know, in our community... Uh, when we talk about Assassin's Creed 2, it's kind of like the Holy Bible of Assassin's Creed. Like, it's the sacred Jedi right. texts. You know, everyone no, has sure. played it 40 million <laughs> times. And they, like, Ezio is is the, you know, the Jesus Christ figure of the Assassin's Creed. Like, it's just, it's it's so ubiquitous. So that I felt like it was it would be interesting to talk to someone who's like, yeah, I played it this year. You know what I mean? Like, because you're not going to think of it in the same way that we will. That's fair. Um, I should also preface with the fact that I also played AC2 partially because it was free, but also because I was abroad in Florence this semester and got sent home early because of COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. And I was like, oh, I want to I want to go back to Florence. <laughs> so, Did it scratch I, that? I was like, accurate? You? Yeah. Was the game accurate um, to, the, to Florence? Okay, so there's actually one... I guess we can just dive into content because the the one like really, really big gripe that I had with AC2, um, which I probably wouldn't have had if I hadn't been to Florence, is um, in Florence, you know, there's the there's the big Duomo, Duomo um, yeah. Santa Maria del Fiore, um, massive church, you know, you know, the one mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and it was built, you know, like just like probably a century before AC2 set. Um, but in front of um santa maria there's uh the baptistry of saint john and it's this big octagonal church where they held baptisms and that existed since like oh god i don't even know like the correct me if i'm wrong like the seventh century or some shit i will not and have so, any knowledge with which to correct you on this <laughs> right f- fair i'll enough. take your word for it you know fair more enough. about this sure, than you would. sure long long ass time ago um and the reason that they built the Duomo where it is, is because of the baptistry and to be playing Assassin's Creed two and not have the baptistry in front of the Duomo was kind of a big jip for me <laughs> because it, you know, I was kind of wanting to like run around the baptistry and like have an authentic, like, you know, running through Florence experience. Um, and I did a little bit of research into it. And the only thing I could find was like one sentence on like the AC wiki about the Duomo and it said some shit about how like because of the Duomo and the bell tower and all the details that went into it they like just couldn't <laughs> add the baptistry or some shit wow i never knew any <laughs> like, of that I, hmm. yeah, yeah me neither. i don't know how, i, I don't no know idea. how any of that added up but like they just I guess they decided to add the Duomo and the bell tower, which, you know, of course makes sense. Yeah. Climbable. I can literally just picture Nick loading it up on his computer and being like, Oh, (laughs) I can't wait to explore the baptistry. Yeah. (laughs) Well, no, no, but like, you know, know. it was like, why the fuck? Yeah. Well, Nick is the baptistry in real life. Something that you could picture climbing in, 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 in a game. Okay. Well, so that's, uh, that that might be. Okay. I could, Real realistically, I could see like if they put the baptistry there, they could make some like bullshit like mounts, you know, like some f- tile falling off or whatever for you to get to the top. And there's like mm-hmm. a feather, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, just one feather, another feather. <laughs> yeah, but like, <laughs> who, but realistically, who on this call no. collected all the feathers. <laughs> uh, that's no. right. Just me, baby. Yep, I can't be fucked. I went ahead no thanks. and yeah. 100% I... of the game on this playthrough, uh, which I am, I'm proud of because I've never done it before. Meant I got to do all the truth glyphs and stuff, which I never did before. Uh, I got to do all the feathers, which was a pain in the ass. Like, if I saw a feather, I yeah. would sometimes go a little bit out of my way to get it. But, like, I'm not spending... 
20 hours looking yeah, for Yeah, I'm not about feathers. to get the auditory cape just to wear it. Yeah. No thanks. Just, just <laughs> for my mom to go, oh, thanks, it reminds me of your fucking 12-year-old brother. <laughs> brother that was slain. <laughs> well, no, but it's... it's it, Okay, it's nice that you mentioned that, <laughs> yeah. though, because one of the strengths of the collectibles in this game compared to AC1 is that they actually kind of mean something to the story. So, no, right, totally. right. I, I, I appreciated that. It was like... Um, Granted, maybe I didn't pay enough attention in Unity or whatever, but, like, there were feathers, and I was like, okay, cool, you can just collect the feathers just for funsies. Um, or, like, the coquettes like, and stuff. Like, here the feathers at least had... Or whatever they're called. Yeah, like, they at least had, like, some significance here, where, like, maybe I didn't give a fuck enough about them to collect it, but, like, they, it was there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 100%ing is a bit of a pain in the ass. And the feathers are the yeah. were the worst part for sure because I did exactly what you did, which is like, oh, I see a feather, I grab it, and so by the end of the game, I had about forty of the hundred feathers. Right, that's probably about where I was. But sitting. the problem mm-hmm. was then, if you want to collect the rest of them, uh, your only option is you you like bring up a map of the feathers that you have to cross reference and like set the location on your game and go. I'm gonna go here because it says there's a feather there, but then you get there. And you don't see a feather, and you don't know if the reason you don't see it is because you don't see it, but it is there, or because you already grabbed it. Which means you can get (laughs) through the whole map and collect every feather you see, and then find out that you have, like, three missing, and the only way to figure out where those three are is by going back to every location. Now, luckily, I figured out that they do show you on the DNA tracker, like, the feather counts for each district. So then I was able to go, oh, okay, okay, I'm missing two in this district. But then that still meant I had to check every single location again in that district, which was a pain in the ass. Kind of a pain in the Mm -hmm. ass. Definitely. But Nick, you know, we're having these memories back in, like, 2010 and 20. 13 trying to play ac2 right, and being like right. wow this is so good you're playing it after <laughs> having literally played odyssey and unity you've seen like two very different points on the <laughs> ac spectrum of what yeah. the gameplay can be like and also different yeah, levels correct. of polish when you started playing ac2 were you like oh my god this sucks or were you like no 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 not at all because like well okay i guess when i started playing ac2 it was like wow these graphics are very 2009 yeah. you know <laughs> but um uh, aside from that i since i didn't play ac1 i was super confused by the opening sequence i mean like <laughs> for this podcast yeah. like i've got i've got a whole page and like a little bit more of notes and i think the first half of that page it's just me writing down notes from the opening sequence going what the fuck is going on <laughs> Well, isn't there like a little last week on Assassin's Creed, like before it starts? There is, there is. Oh no, I didn't have that. Uh, you, you're a you're a cutscene think... skipper. Is what happened? You skipped all the cutscenes. Yeah, because explains. Desmond's like, this is what happened oh, in the last game, Nick. <laughs> oh, I okay. Then I I guess I missed it then. Well, you know, it's it's funny you say that, Nick, <laughs> just because <laughs> one of my notes is complimenting the opening scene and how like crazy it is. Yeah. And the, oh, and then plus like. Holy Christ, I really, maybe, maybe this is just me. Maybe you guys don't feel the same way, but like, uh, Lucy's fine, I guess. <laughs> but, um, Sh- Sean and Rebecca suck. <laughs> I think they do suck in AC2. I do. I think, I think Sean, Rebecca's fine. Sean's just, I mean, Rebecca's fine, but Rebecca just doesn't have anything to do, really. Sean's just a total oh. dickhead that ha- says nothing but like, hold on one second. I want to answer the spam call. Hello? You trusted them, and they did something against you. Press one, press one, press one. What the fuck? I'm talking about <laughs> a spiritual attack that you are dealing with due to this individual. Press one now so that you can... Guys, do I press, press one? one? Press one <laughs> yeah, I, I think now. they want you to press they one. They were around you, but they did something against you. Press one to hear this what word. The press fuck? one. If you wish to no longer receive these messages, please hit the option three now. Oh, I would, I would hit three. Wow, right? that that really undercuts the message. It's like press one, but also if you don't want to hear this anymore, press three. <laughs> <laughs> that was so bizarre. <laughs> That's the weirdest spam call I've ever heard. What happened was about a week ago, they were like, "Would you like us to pray with you?" <laughs> press one, press one, and I was like, "Yes." So I press one. What happens if you press two? 
No, Tim, Tim, Tim. Your only options are one or three. If you press two, it it you don't want to press two. You press two. You go into cardiac arrest. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need someone to pray for you if you press two. Sorry, what were we talking about? Um, we were talking about like Sean and Sean. Oh, yeah, Sean. Sean opening. is a dick, yeah. and he's just like he's one of those. I feel like Ubisoft does this a lot. Where they're like, oh, we need to come up with a personality for this character. Let's just make them really mean for no reason. And then, so yeah. you just go over and you're like, hey, sh- hey, guy, what's up? And he's like, if you'll excuse me, I'm doing important work and you can bugger off. And it's like, <laughs> okay, well, that was kind of yeah. uncalled for, dude. Like, I don't know why you needed to treat me that way. Rebecca's always just like... I don't know. She always just seems way too fucking. Pa- she seems like she's on speed all the time. <laughs> I think you would need to be on speed to build an actual functioning an animus. animus with an no animus. resources I mean, I whatsoever. See, you know, speaking of Sean, Desmond's literally like suffering from the bleeding effect and is like screaming in his in his in the middle of the night while he's sleeping. And he wakes up late one morning, and Sean is like, "That's very professional of you, Desmond." Like. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want to get in the animus, you fuck? I'm hallucinating because <laughs> yeah. you guys are torturing me mentally on a eight hours a day basis. <laughs> Maybe not also be a dick about it, please, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Rebecca Rebecca's always like she's very peppy. She's she's just always ready to go, you know? Rebecca's cool. <laughs> I definitely think all of them get a personality upgrade in Brotherhood for sure. They for oh, sure really? do. Yeah. Yeah, they fucking if they're gonna keep them around, they fucking better. Because there's, I there's a reason that like our our fan community were like we love Sean and Rebecca and we want to see more of them, and like they'll make an appearance every four games or something when you get a writer who like cares what the fans think about their game. Yeah, we haven't seen them since Syndicate, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You mean you're telling me you prefer Sean and Rebecca over Layla Hassan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. yeah. You're kidding. Yeah, it's kind of funny though, because Nick, because Nicholas's perspective of Sean and Rebecca is like they suck because the only games he's played <laughs> yeah. is where they don't is exist. The ones, the <laughs> ones that they don't exist, and the one where they're introduced and they're really dumb and boring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know I shouldn't speak like that. Someone in the comments is going to be like, actually, uh. Sean and Rebecca in AC2 uh, saved my dad's life. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean. There's to hurt not, your there's feelings. not enough people that listen to podcasts that you're gonna get that. No, we just get them in the DMs, so you can't see them. Yeah, okay, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all of our our hundreds of fans that only DM us, they don't comment on things. Don't forget the fans that you know are fake porn bots looking for like. Oh yeah, those milfs. are fun. As Nick does, I have notes I took as well. I don't know if you took notes last time. I've got notes. I've got seven notes. I just don't know in what order you want to like like go about the notes. I think... You know what? I've got another note that I would like to address. <laughs> that, we can start with me. <laughs> <laughs> Give us the note. Um, I don't know. I, this wasn't anything that I like hated throughout the game. I just kind of find it fucking goofy that all of the dialogue is in English, but then you'll get things along the lines of, I, I wrote one down that was like, on the count of three, uno, due, tre, and then you like start a race. Yeah. Or like, What's wrong I don't know, that? there was, well, oh, hold on, there Italians, was like this career Nick? mission where Do like, Italians, where like Nick? I'm supposed to deliver this letter to this guy <laughs> in the Tuscan countryside, and like I get there and he's only speaking Italian, and then he just starts <laughs> fucking fighting me. I'm like, why am I fighting this guy? Did you have subtitles on? <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you'd have subtitles on. Well, okay, I guess, but yeah, because I don't like, know if you know still, this, but if you turn on subtitles, it gives you the English translation of the Italian. Yeah, that's kind of the rule of thumb for this game: is you gotta turn them on immediately. Because because every other word in their sentences is like some Italian. Curse every every word time they curse, it's in Italian. No, I know. Which like okay, the cursing schifo. in Italian that's fine, but like cazzo. But like every Merda. now and again, like they just like had this <laughs> random ass like Italian sentence just kind of like blurted in no, there. No, that's it's true. Kinda, I don't know. It, it just kind of felt it kind of felt goofy to me. Well, sometimes. here's I have a question for you, Nick. Yeah. What was your overall impression of the story of AC two? The story was really, really good. Okay. I I cannot say I have any complaints about the story. Interesting. No, yeah. It's I, I like that shit a lot. I really like the idea of being able to have Leonardo da Vinci just as like a side character that 
um, still helps you along and whatever, especially since so much of AC2 is rooted in the importance of the Renaissance yeah. and, you know, all that jazz. I felt like having him in there was really cool. And like I said, you know, they had Nic- Niccolo Machiavelli in there for like a short period. Um, the Medici's were a really big part of it in um, when you were in Florence. So I, I really, really liked being able to incorporate all of the big characters into the storyline as well. For sure. Um, I mean, it's it's also interesting, yeah. too, because AC2 kind of set that precedent for having, like, a fun historical cast. Yeah. No, yeah. And, like, and the whole idea of, like, you know, you're trying to get revenge on whoever these people are. You don't know anything about this order, but, like, oh, I don't know. My dad was one of these guys, and he died, and he wanted me to learn about it. Uh, my uncle's telling me about it, so, like... I might as well do this if this is what my dad wanted me to do anyways, and it'll help me, like, you know, avenge his murderers. Um, And then, you know, going to going to Monteregiori or however the hell it's. Monteregioni. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, whatever Um, that shit is. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. Why are Nardos going to Venice? Oh, crazy. I'm also going to Venice. Um, and you know, like kicking it in Venice a little bit, killing some hoes there. <laughs> I I really um, loved the 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 story, especially the first time I played it. Like, it's always been kind of in in my like top two, like kind of struggling against Black Flag, and I always kind of go back and forth between them, trying to figure out like which one I think is the the better story or which one that I enjoy the most. And I sure. definitely think that AC two is the best story when it comes to the focus on the assassins and the way that the assassins are, are incorporated. AC two nailed what for me is the ideal vision of what role the assassins should play in the story. I love the scene where he starts to realize that all of these associates and friends that he's been working with over the course of the game are, are all yep. assassins and that they've all been kind of guiding him through this process and that yeah that was pretty because great. it's one thing to have like oh my family were assassins so now i'm an assassin too it's another thing that like oh these people that i'm friends with and these people who have helped me and who have like supported me in this revenge quest they're all assassins and they're all following this creed and, and maybe i should take it seriously and something else that i like along those lines that i really appreciated was like the very first time you play as Ezio. Uh, you're gonna have to remind me of the name. I can't remember the kid, but like you go and you fight this like Vieri. What looks like yeah, yeah, Vieri. You go and fight the Vieri, and like you think he's just this like you know punk ass kid of like oh you know rival family or whatever, mm-hmm. and then like you go fuck your girlfriend afterwards. <laughs> and it's like yeah, okay, you know, cool teenager stuff, whatever. Yeah. And then you find out that oh wait, he's a rival because you know his dad's part of the templars well, but, and your dad's but part that's, of the assassins well but that well well yes that is true but Ezio and vieri like Ezio doesn't know that vieri is a templar you but know? vieri definitely no, no, knows I know. that Ezio is an assassin so that plays a role no but that's exact that's exactly what i'm saying is that Ezio doesn't know that until right yeah he starts learning all this and then once he does as a viewer it was like oh shit this is like it yeah makes sense sure. that like you know you would have beef with this dude if he knew if you know vieri knew that he was an assassin but even if Ezio didn't know right. that he was a templar right it's an interesting so. coincidence yeah honestly the whole introduction the whole like first couple sequences of the game like there was just something the first time i played it when you you hand the the note to uberto and he's like ah oh, this is just a problem i'll i'll you know i'll see to it. everything will be fixed in the morning like i had this this dread in that moment where i was like Ooh, I know that I know that this isn't going to turn out the way that I uh, that I think it will, but like I was almost lying to myself. Like I was almost like, oh, I kind of like maybe no, it, this they're not just going to kill his family and the, like I don't know. I I was dreading it, and when it happened, and I couldn't stop it, and Uberto had betrayed me and betrayed my family. Like like it's not enough, and I think that all of these other Assassin's Creed games, Unity is a great example of doing it wrong, where they think that they can that they can earn an emotional reaction and they can earn an empathy out of you just by like hey see this guy's dad <laughs> they're dead now like there's no <laughs> there's no like moment of like actually getting to know these people or actually yeah, getting fair. to build an emotional connection to them yourself i mean arno loses two dads in unity and i couldn't care less about either one of them right but yep, because right. they gave mm-hmm. you that sequence to like help your sister and, and help your little brother with his feathers and 
you know, run to the top of the church with your older brother and talk to your dad who's being a friendly, good dad. Like, I cared about those people, and I remembered their names after playing the game, which I I could maybe summon the names of Arno's dads right now, but it, it would be more effort than I'm willing to expend. But, like, w- another thing I really liked about that, too, was that not only did they give you that emotional connection to make you, you know, feel bad for um, for Ezio, but it, it was also a really, really good way of saying – Oh yeah, hey, you know this is how you climb, and this is how you're gonna street race, and yeah. like this is you it know was like all you're doing well shit with your sister and for your mother, and it's it's a very good way of doing the introduction without just like, oh yeah, you know, just like press A to jump. Or yeah, like, it's, it's very, certainly better than AC One. It's very tutorial. classic storytelling. Like it's not reinventing the wheel, but it is nailing the no, execution. It's doing a really good job. Absolutely. Of like yeah, just roping you in and, and giving you those those feelings. And I spent the entire game like wanting to get revenge on the people who had to do with with that. You know, it was it did its job. I think that continued to me even into that sequence where you fo- first go to the villa, um, and yeah. your uncle's telling you about shit, and your uncle's like, "Oh, your dad didn't tell you anything," yeah. and it's like you have to learn from your uncle, and so then he trains you how to fight, and then you realize, oh, well, there's this villa that my family's had for fucking forever we might as well hide out here so we don't die in florence and so it and for me one of my favorite parts of the game was being able to go around and get the treasure chests and get the paintings and all that to increase money Mm -hmm. for the villa because it was like oh you know like this is this is i own this this is my thing it's inherited Yeah. yeah yeah exactly and like I was just going to say, like, the more paintings and the more armor and everything you got, the better it ended up helping you. Exactly. And I think the way it was a really good integration, their rationale was if you do these things and get more things, it gives you more money in the long run, but not just because, mm-hmm. oh, you know, magically it does. It was like, yeah. oh, yeah, you do these things. They go to the villa. It increases tourism, which will naturally uh, give you more money and then you have more money to buy more stuff to help your health along the way and shit like that. And I thought that was a really, really good integration. Even collecting the feathers increases the, the, the value exactly, of, of yeah. the place. So right. everything is integrated in that system. And Which does that make sense? Huh? Does that make sense though? That I found a feather and my villa started making more money. I mean, does it make well, sense? Yeah. No, yeah, but I'm like, just, but <laughs> I'm just being a dick. I know, but it will. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it also doesn't make sense that why would buying a sword increase or a painting the value? for your villa? But, but no, I yeah. I do really enjoy the villa. Don't get me wrong. But something that is worth mentioning too is the impact of training with Mario and whatnot is. Um, you see a two year time jump, yeah. you know, Ezio is like a little bit more mature and yeah. he's learned a lot from his uncle. And so it, it, it makes a little bit more sense that he's not this master, you know, uh, combatant over a month, you know, it's yeah. been two years. So we didn't just start out being a master combatant with no training. Like many of the protagonists do. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love the way that the game handles time, even though it technically doesn't do a great job. Like, like, I think as far as a storytelling device, the time jumps are really effective and you do get this feeling that like you're witnessing a story over this long period of time. You're witnessing, you know, growth. Obviously, like, yeah, they don't age up the characters at all other than like, I mean, Roger Craig Smith is doing a lot of legwork with his voice for Ezio and he does a great job. But I mean, this carries on like they start brotherhood and he's just got a beard and that's the only difference. And he's supposed to be 40 years old, like working with the limitations of what they had at the time. I get it. I've wanted to see like ever since then an Assassin's Creed game that like actually does the same thing where it's like, let's tell an Epic story. Let's have this, you know, last over 10 years, 15 years, whatever, but also do the legwork to like have the, protagonist and have the city change over that time would be super cool um i understand why they don't because it's a pain in the ass but i still think that they are missing the opportunity of telling those kinds of interesting stories that way yeah for sure i mean that's the thing is i mean you and i mentioned this on on the on one of the more recent episodes it's just like it's so effective to have a story take place over even just a decade you know this one takes over two decades and 
And that's why a lot of people right. like Ezio so much is because we see him grow and we see him grow with his family and the people that he fights with. You know, and something something yeah. to something, something to say also about like his family and the and the impact of a lot of this stuff. I think has a lot to do with how AC2 embraces actual cutscenes that have direction. Yeah. Like the like being able to see Ezio like like there's that opening scene with its with its gangs of New York inspiration, you know? It's like like we know that we're going to get ready for like a different experience just by starting the game. And just to go out back to like the modern day stuff, like the game opens with like an action packed set piece with cutscenes that yeah. are actually yeah, directed and coming off of AC1 I really experienced this as like, like so like liberating because in AC one you can just pick different ca- camera angles. There's not a single cutscene in the game. And like I thought, like that cutscene where it shows um, the Medici's, you know, being assassinated or the oh, yeah. attempted to be assassinated outside of Duomo. I mean, it's it's just so well done because it's yeah. like you think that you know he's probably not going to die because he's so important but like they also killed your dad so he might die and it's not until like you know you have to fight these guys off and you help him back to his little villa or whatever that that you know he you realize he's going to live and it's fine but it's just it's very well done and well executed and i think without that cutscene, if you just like seen them like running up and then immediately like you can sprint up there and start attacking people and you know or whatever just it wouldn't have been as effective yeah well yeah well because you feel helpless exactly yeah like oh shit like i want to dive in and like you know jump on the attackers but i can't well it's also interesting too because in that scene they also introduced the enemy type that knocks your sword out of your hand so it's like, right. wow, I'm even more defenseless than I was just before. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. So I feel like for everything that we like about the story, I definitely like coming back to the game now, all these years later, there were things that I did notice about the story that bothered me. Yes. And you yes. had a similar experience. Maybe, Nick, you can kind of hear what we're saying and tell us if we're being overly sure. critical or if we're on the money. You, you guys may or may not remember... Um, I did a video on YouTube three years ago about Assassin's Creed Origins, and I make a particular complaint about the fact that I feel like something stories do a lot when they're a little when they're being a little bit lazy about theme and about character arcs is if you're doing a story about a revenge quest to have your character at the very end go oh I'm I'm above this I don't need to get revenge when. Mm-hmm. Typically, when that happens, it's something that kind of comes out of nowhere. There won't have been much about the story beforehand expressing any, you know, internal conflict about the idea of revenge. You know, that's not true for all things that do that arc. Some do it really well. But it does seem to be the case that, like, if you were to not do that and you were to just have the character get revenge and do exactly what they were intending to do from the beginning... You might look at that as a writer and be like, okay, well, there's not much of a character change. There's not like a moment or a turn that would make this ending feel more significant. So they'll kind of sprinkle it in there and be like, okay, well, you know, I'm not strong enough to, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get this revenge after all. I'm above this. And while that's something that didn't bother me before, it did ring especially cheap to me playing AC2 this time, just because I felt like... yes. You know, yeah, you are literally killing multiple guards on the way into the church to kill Rodrigo. And there's also the whole element of even besides whether or not you're above revenge or you're above killing people, the fact of his existence and continued breathing is going to be a problem for the world. He is a powerful Templar. Your job as an assassin (laughs) is to kill Templars. You've been doing it the whole time. You never had a problem with it. So why are we letting him live now? Obviously we know they're letting him live because he did not canonically in the real world die in that year. We get that and that's fine. But, I think there are a number of ways they could have kept him alive without having to make Ezio be like, I am above these in the last minute for no reason. Yeah, I mean, just have him escape just somehow. Have, like, yeah, just have exactly. Rodrigo use some yeah. piece of Eden magic to dip out of there. Like, oh, there was the third piece or, of Eden I didn't know about, and he used it to escape well, anything. Like, if anything, though, like they, they, they could have gotten the vault open, they're tussling, and then Rodrigo starts to escape, and Ezio 
starts to hear a voice coming through the vault and right. he's drawn it could have been it. like the vault will only right. open for the true prophet so why don't we find out which one of us it is and then go from there like i don't know there are a lot of interesting ways they could have done it they did it in one of the least interesting ways they possibly could have well you know what's also not really compelling about it is because just before he's like i am above this he tries to kill him twice. <laughs> like, in five to ten minute intervals, he tries to kill him once, and he's like, I thought I was beyond this. Yeah. And he's not, and he tries to stab him. And then he tries to do it again, and then he's like, oh, I don't feel like it anymore. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> It's pretty weak. It's weak sauce. <laughs> and it's like, it's such a bad way to like cap off this uh, otherwise pretty great story be, right be, like yeah. it, it's such a lame way to do it it'd be one you thing know, like, yeah, that's if, fair. if throughout the game every time he kills one of his targets he feels bad about it and he's like i wish i did not have to do all of this killing you know <laughs> like <laughs> that'd be great <laughs> but wait but but especially when there's like entire fucking plots where you just go around killing yeah. guards just because like there's yeah. there's like a That's there's on one like robber guy Dude, connected but- with some chick that you just kind of met and she says yeah go free this dude and you go yeah sure fuck it okay who do I need to kill to do it you don't even know that they're connected to the assassins you just kind of fucking go it's also pretty fucking stupid too that he's the fucking pope and he knows that you <laughs> he knows that you're a bad person like a bad guy to him and he wants to murder your entire family. He would have murdered you if he had the chance. Yeah. Why are you letting him live even if you are above this? Why would you let <laughs> such a powerful person live like just to come back and fuck your shit up? Especially it's so stupid. Especially considering a courtesan can be like that guy called me a bitch and you'll just run over and stab him in the throat. <laughs> Dude, you can literally stab the messengers that steal your money. <laughs> you literally, there's a guard in one of the tomb missions, and he's like, one wrong move, and I won't be coming home to my wife. And then you're like, yeah, you fuck, you're not. And you fucking slit his throat yeah. open. It's like, <laughs> yeah. We know there are a lot of rationalizations and that, you know, oh, some of those guards aren't really canonically there. They're, like, created by the animus so that you have something to do in this game. Like, there are a lot of things, but at the end of the day, even if you looked at it purely on a canon basis, you ignored the guards, it still is fucking stupid for Ezio to be like, I am above these, right as he's about to kill Rodrigo Borgia. Yeah, but, he, but he's left a trail of Templar bodies yeah, behind exactly. him. Exactly. So, all right, we're all in agreement. Please tell us in the comments why we're wrong. I'm, I actually really want to hear a solid argument for why this is a great ending and it makes perfect sense. Uh, whoever's yeah. up to the task, leave us some hate mail. And we will enjoy reading and responding to that. I'm sure I won't. I probably won't even hear about it. (laughs) Well, we should also consider, too, that aside from the ending being kind of lackluster, there is an an, an issue when it comes to... People have pointed this out before, and and while I don't think it's super extreme, there are definitely things that happen with Ezio in this game. And he doesn't so much suffer consequences. He's kind of like... With the Doge, he gets the Doge killed, and people think that he did it. He didn't. But then in the very next mission, like you're like, one doge was not enough. And you kill the other doge, <laughs> the Templar one, and no one seems to care. No one's like, that guy just killed two dojes. Really what happened to, to the really other? need to figure out how this guy's killing all these fucking dojes. Yeah, like that, that that's two dojes, right? <laughs> one after the other. What just happened? <laughs> no one seems to care. You go back to the V and you're like, yes, I just killed the doge. <laughs> just- I, I think with killing the dojes... Um, came my favorite gameplay mechanic in AC2. The hidden gun? It's like, no, okay, well, the gun, the gun's a different thing, but, like, um, when it's like, okay, you've killed this important guy, now, like, okay, you're in this big, you know, area with a lot of guards they're coming at you escape the area and in Florence, like, you've either got to run and you got to mm-hmm. hide or you just got to fucking fight them off and in Venice, I was like, nah, fuck it. I'm just going to c- go jump in a canal and hide under a bridge for 20 seconds. <laughs> and then everyone goes, oh, where did he go? You, know, you, know? you made your own hiding And then they, they just, they just got to leave. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they can't go to the water. The diving button in this game is really fun. Like, yeah. you're diving so, off a big building. Yeah. So while we're talking about things <laughs> yeah. that we didn't like, I want to mention something just kind of. Ooh, I had a nitpick. really, I had a really solid segue I was about to hit. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Speaking of diving and being in the water, Nick, 
Do you remember in Bonfire of the Vanities, <laughs> the, 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 the quest that's on a boat? I've never played Bonfire of the Vanities. I'm asking Nick. Oh. <laughs> is this is this this is that one of those DLC ones, yeah. right? You had to mm-hmm. get into the water. Oh the my boat. god, yeah, you've yeah, you've got to yeah, oh. god, fuck that boat, man. Doesn't Good that Christ. Fucking entire quest Holy. Suck balls. It's that one took me like minimum an hour, like 2 hours to complete, and the Jeez. only reason I was able to fucking get it is because um, I noticed at one point there was a glitch where like one of the guards like stopped moving or whatever, and I was only able to get it because I took advantage of the glitch of the guard moving because I would get to like one motherfucker left, and I was about to go in and kill this guy undetected, and then I'd, I'd move like half a pixel to my left, and one of these big boy motherfuckers would spot me, and it's mission over. And it's like, well, yeah. t- there I've, goes 20 fucking minutes. I've played this game more times than I've drawn breath, and that fucking mission still takes me oh my an God, hour every man. time. I always, this time I had to remind myself, like, our good buddy Treviso on his stealth channel did a Unity stealth run that took him 946 tries. <laughs> I just yeah. have to remind myself, like he can do that, so I can do this. So you know? I can do this. <laughs> I can I can take twelve or thirteen tries to get onto this fucking boat. Eventually, I resorted to just googling, like, what did other people do, and just following the instructions. Yeah, exactly. that's fair. Because um, yeah, man, that fucking quest sucks a cock. It's the worst, and I honestly oh, I so hate bad. the DLC sequences entirely because. Oh yeah, they no, completely kill the pacing of the story. I understand oh, that they're like, okay, well, we're gonna do these DLC later, and they'll just slot into the story there. That's fine, but I think I would have preferred it if they let me finish the story and then say, oh, hey, you know what? These are those things that he did in between, and you can do them now. Yeah, that would have been so much better because then you can treat it as a completely extraneous thing, and it's not killing the fucking pacing. Because right when you get to the moment where you're there with all your assassin buddies, you got the piece of Eden, you know where this motherfucker is, you're going to go kill him at the Vatican, you're ready to go. And it's like, here's three <laughs> hours of dicking around in Forley and <laughs> fighting a priest, yeah. and I don't give a shit about any of it. It seems like at least every sequence, whether minorly or majorly, at least has some sort of aspect to it in which Ezio is either killing or working towards killing somebody that was responsible for the murder of his family and then those two sequences are like yeah there's a there's a fight in Forley go fight and then yeah there's some priests go kill the priests. No that's and a like, very good point because uh, uh, it, it, it not only breaks the pacing but it also breaks like the objective. Exactly it's like uh, it's like okay sure I get like I'm a I'm a good guy vigilante motherfucker now like i'm helping people but like it 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 doesn't serve any real functional purpose yeah it's well, really bad also it's Ezio gives good. a very unrelated speech like the speech is good but it's kind of irrelevant to the rest of the story because he's like it would have consumed me and it, it it did consume you because you tried to kill rodrigo at the end of the game <laughs> you motherfucker <laughs> like look it's a great speech and i love it but it's it's it's, it's it's not very uh, compelling when you think that literally after he gives that speech about revenge not consuming you, he then goes and lets revenge consume him. <laughs> but, I mean, then he doesn't because he spares Rodrigo. If anything, that speech is the closest we get to a character justification for why he would not kill Rodrigo. Yeah, but, but you're he right. tried to twice before he did. If you're above getting revenge, you could just not go to the Vatican. <laughs> you know Exactly. He could just, he could not, just try. not do it. I mean, I guess he's got to take the fucking piece of Eden or whatever. But he's kind of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't because he shouldn't have gone there. Like, didn't he have to go get the staff though? No, 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 no. Well, what I'm saying is, if he does kill Rodrigo, yeah, then he's letting revenge consume him, which is the right decision to make. But if he doesn't, then he's making the stupid decision of letting a a Pope Templar live. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like. I think I think the solution that we provided earlier, just have Rodrigo escape, solves that problem. Yeah, he gets. Yeah, exactly. But then the the writers are probably looking at that, going, "Well, what was Ezio's character arc? How do we make the ending dramatic?" And that's I think a worthwhile question to ask. But there's got to be something built into the story that allows him to have that moment in the end that feels like you've earned it. 
and isn't completely out of left field. At the same time, if that was the justification of, oh, we have to have Ezio have some sort of a character arc, why couldn't they have just, like, let him escape and then had some, like, you know, stupid-ass playable, you know, epilogue at the end? Right. I mean, you could do the thing, too, where where you complete your revenge and then afterwards you're like, damn, revenge it's actually doesn't fix anything. Right. That yeah. would have been right. maybe equally as, you know, f- flaccid, but... Well, I think the thing that I'm trying to say is typically in order to express a character arc, the the unit that you use to do it is with a choice, is with the choices that the character makes. And they're looking for a choice that Ezio can make in the ending that would be unexpected, would be something that would signify that he's grown. And this is like the easiest thing to do for that. But if they had dug a little deeper, thought a little harder about like, what is actually the story we're telling about Ezio's growth? Like, there, there, there's, yeah, there's better ways to do it, that's all. Well, you also have to consider, too, that, like, throughout the entire game, Ezio is is often, like, not afraid to, to kill anyone. And he even says one time, he, he, like, jokingly, he's like, well, that saves me from having to bloody my sword. Plus, you know, in the, there's one choice he makes early on to establish an arc is that when he's killing Vieri, he fucking murders the shit out of him, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's a really yeah. intense yeah. moment. Yeah. And then Mario comes in and he's like, no, we have to be respectful of the dead. And he teaches him the Requiescat and Pache thing. Great moment, but it is something that they oh, resolved yeah. immediately. It's not like, you know, oh, later on he realizes he has to be courteous of, of, you know, he's learning to be, you know, respectful of the dead. Yeah, but then he isn't, though, because... Also, consider this, too. And I might I might consider it, Tim. If. OK, so, you know, when you kill uh, you go kill you go kill Ferrari's dad, Francesco. Yeah. You know how his body is like strung up in his underwear <laughs> from the rope? <laughs> like, if Ezio did that, was that so good. then he literally did not listen to a word of that advice. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it is shot in a way that it could have been the thieves that did it. But uh, but if Ezio if Ezio is seeing him like seeing them unclothe him he's like yes do it it's like <laughs> you're you're not listening to your uncle's advice yeah that's a fair see point. I don't know see I'm I'm with you there Tim like I I always uh, part of that where like it definitely seemed to me more like it could have been the thieves but you're right it does it does seem a little sus as to how they can say I'm always surprised yeah, he, by he that he understood it for everything else but well yeah because it's like Ezio's like you're right I must respect the dead but also <laughs> I'm going to nod my head at Francesco De Pazzi's naked body strung up on a rope <laughs> Yeah. Like, you know what? Maybe Ezio just said "fuck Francesco de Pazzi," but like these other guys, like you know that they, they didn't directly kill my dad, respect. so like I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't That's know. A good Wait, point so to... hey, by the way, Lawson. Yeah, what's up? No, no, no I was just gonna say if my Ezio impression is like super embarrassing, just cut it out of the podcast. No, it's actually it's better than mine. I think. <laughs> I don't. think No, so. I think it's pretty funny. I think it's funny. Okay, I well then, good. well then, cut out me mentioning it. I will. Cut this part out. I will. <laughs> you know what, Tim? I think it's pretty cute. I only have one more note. Okay, what's your note? Um, when you had to go around and collect the fucking the the glyphs, the glyphs. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So when you had to go around and collect the glyphs, I thought that was fun as like a side piece. I thought I don't know. Maybe I thought that there were a little too many of them, but that was fine. I didn't mind them. Did but you do them all? Coding them. I think I got like. The first time I played it through in like April or whatever, um, I don't think I did. I got like I don't know, maybe five shy or whatever. This one, I think I was only missing one. Oh wow! It I don't know. Like they were fun to get and all, but decoding them at first was like, oh okay, cool. There's this little turny little thing slidey. that's a puzzle. That's fun. And like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. It's like there's like a code, and you gotta turn the thing to the right code, and it's fine. But then at the end, it's like, okay, there's these random ass fuck ass shapes that aren't even shapes; they're just <laughs> lines, and you gotta figure out which set of lines oh corresponds yeah. to which number. It's so frustrating. And then, oh my god, yeah, I was the last like two or three. I stared at them for like five minutes, and then I got a headache, and, and I was like, it. all right, we're we're going to wiki. Well, yeah, yeah, because. There, there are ones where I feel like 
you know, if I was playing this game the year it came out and I just had to spend as much time as possible playing this game, I would just sit there and try to solve it. But there were some of them that were oh, so fucking head scratching that I could literally see myself <laughs> staring and working on this puzzle for an hour. <laughs> and is yeah. that really what I want no, to be doing like, when I play an Assassin's Creed game? Not really. Right. After I looked it up, I was like, oh, okay, that's dumb, but like at least it makes sense. There were some I looked up and I was like, I'm I'm like generally, I'm fairly smart and I never would have figured that out. I could have figured it out. I don't know, maybe, but like it was definitely way beyond the scope of what I was, the mental <laughs> energy that yeah. I was well, trying to put you in. You know, the ones that pissed me off the most were the ones where you had to like line up the spherical painting. And See, I didn't mind that. Those were all piss easy. But then they got really hard in the last like four or five of them, and they made me want to kill myself. No, see, I never, I never, I never minded the spherical paintings. It was always the like one equals this bullshit. Spoilers they're, for they're next week, like, though. If you do them in Brotherhood, uh, those spherical painting ones fucking suck in Brotherhood. Uh, but that's in AC two, well, yeah, AC two, they're fine. Yeah, but no, yeah. Well, but in AC two, they're like this. They're, they're always this obscure ass painting, and you don't know which way is upright. You know, it's just like. I had trouble with them personally. I don't know, Tim. Maybe you should just start going to art museums. Maybe, Tim. Maybe awesome. you should take a mental competency test. <laughs> <laughs> I did. It's whether or not I enjoyed Unity. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. Specifically, Unity Parkour at Sebastian Delaria at Memento underscore Gallery on Twitter. <laughs> Because he would say, if you did not enjoy Unity Parkour, you are mentally deficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, so Nick, that was the last of your notes. Yeah, that was the last of my note. Well, so I guess I could, I guess I could just put in my little nitpick about uh, gameplay. Um, compared to AC One, the combat in this game is is not up to par. Um, I like it better. The combat. Um, the sound design is way off. It doesn't sound like you're fighting with swords. It sounds like you're you're fighting with like nerf pool noodles. Um, not a fan. I disagree. I don't like the little animus uh, effects on the guards. It really takes a cinematic feel off of it, knowing that every guard has a little has a little white the fucking halo around them. Yeah, but AC one um, did that, but worse. No, AC AC one does it a little bit more subtle in my in my recollection. Nah, I disagree. Well, also every time you swing your sword or any weapon. There's a little animus like outline on the sword. Did you notice that? It drives me up the wall. Oh, I didn't notice that. I never noticed. Every, okay, it. so so load up the game or just watch a video. I'm not gonna Every do time that. you swing your sword, there's a little animus flicker on the outline of your sword and it follows you the whole entire swing. It looks ridiculous. <laughs> oh, here's my nitpick. I 100 percent of the game, but and, and it shows that I have 100 percent sync. But there are Templar layers or something that you can only get if you like pre-ordered the game at Walmart, which obviously I didn't do. And while some of the things that are pre-order specific I can activate on Uplay, I can't seem to activate these Templar layers for whatever reason. And as such, there is a part of my DNA tracker that is just going to be empty forever. Oh, one of them came with the Walmart pre-order. One of them came with the GameStop pre-order. And one of them came with the fucking Amazon, what the fuck, I don't know, pre-order. So, like, I don't have that <laughs> shit. And it's been 10, it's been 11 years since this game came out. Why are those not just in the game now for everybody? Because fuck you. Yeah, because fuck you, that's why. <laughs> yeah, because fuck me. Something I think is, is worth mentioning in terms of like the story and, and why this story is more impactful to some people than AC1 and whatnot. I think it's important to mention how even like very insignificant characters in this game have personality. Like for instance, the thief and the courtesan that you deliver the letter to at the beginning, he's like, Don't yeah, worry, I'm not contagious. Yeah. She might be. And, and you see that guy once again at the execution and he tells you to run. That's it. run, boy. That's it. And fast. And But they, so they they didn't need to provide such a character with like any form of joke or one-liner or anything. No, Tim, I'm with you. I, I like the, I like and that you, shit but a lot. You also that have is a this, really, really nice detail. Yeah, and I mean, you also have this like lengthy database now that, prov that, 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 that provides you with little videos on the targets that you're facing. Little, like these, like even the buildings get attention and you can look in the database and see like, what's the history of this building? The entire world and, and, and universe feels alive because every little aspect has some thought put into it. And I think that's something that's lacking in AC one because a lot of the characters you interact with outside of your targets 
in, well, you do, you don't. You interact with your targets and you inter- and you interact with the bureau leaders. That's it. In this game, you interact with so many different people. Uh, I think that's that, not true. I also interact with the beggar lady who's like, <laughs> please, sir, can I have some money? <laughs> I'm poor and sick and hungry. I'm poor and sick and hungry. <laughs> that's why I think we think back on this one a little bit more uh, fondly because, because also I think it represents a new status quo for the assassins and that the assassins are, are more of the people. And in, in, in AC1, they're perched up in Masyaf and they kind of like tower over. In this game, though, yeah. They're made up of, of whores and thieves and mercenaries, and it's all... We call them sex workers, it's, Tim. It's all this... No, well, I only say whores because they call them whores in the game. <laughs> they call them courtesans in the game. They call them whores. They call them courtesans. No, they don't. Yes, Tim. they do. Tim, if you Tim, if you don't support <laughs> sex work, just admit Sex work it. is Tim, you're such a work. hypocrite. I'm literally subscribed to your OnlyFans. Hey, no one's supposed <laughs> to know about that. I didn't even know about that. I might have to subscribe. I'm I'm the only fan. That's why it's called uh, that. Ah, yes, yes, of course. So yeah, it's made up of just courtesans and mercenaries and thieves. It, you know, it's 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 not, not, horse, not it's it's not just this just like stagnatic castle up above that only a you know select people are a part of. It, it's it's more and and obviously I appreciate that vibe from that game because a normal person like Ezio is being thrust into this battle and you're learning the new status quo for the assassins through Ezio, through his family. It's a really interesting evolution of the creed and of the assassins and Templars that we see in this game. And just for the second game of the series to do such a big jump, I think it's pretty cool. I also think it's pretty cool. I agree with everything you just said. You took the words right out of my dick, as always, Tim. As always, guys, there are several ways you can support this show, which costs you absolutely nothing. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, like the episode, comment on the episode telling us what you thought. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Hookblade, where we often tweet little clips from the show, questions and jokes and stuff. Liking and retweeting those tweets can be very helpful to us, too. Um, And be sure to recommend the show to anybody you know who likes Assassin's Creed. Nick, where can people find you if they want to slide into your DMs? Um, You can find me on Twitter at GingaNinja799. That's uh, G-I-N-G-A-N-I-N-J-A-799. Um, (laughs) If you uh, want to support this podcast and its friends um, with monetary value, you can also hit me up on Venmo (laughs) at Nicholas Collins. (laughs) Nick, thank you for joining us and sharing your unique perspective on AC2. You know, I was really just trying to live up to the precedent set by Putrid Moldy Man, so I really appreciate you guys having me on. <laughs> he set the bar high, we know. He did. He really did. I hope I can live up to him, yes. <laughs> um, I've been the first host. And I've been other host. And I've been guest host. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week when we talk about Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Get ready for it, brother. <laughs> the hook and the blade so you can use one or the other an elegant design next time i call you i'm gonna be like press one press one press one (laughs) can you leave that in the podcast oh i'm leaving it in baby (laughs) (laughs) i'm leaving that shit in that's so good that was the best moment that i've experienced all week anyway